Well, hi, Catherine, and good afternoon. Lovely to have you here. I mean, especially lovely to have you here, since your plane caught on fire on the way here. Tell us about that. Well, we just took off, and all of a sudden you could smell smoke in the, co- in the cabin, and they said, oh, we're going to have to turn around and land really quickly. Um, so they had fire engines ready in Atlanta, and we were delayed a couple of hours, but I just screamed in to New Orleans, so... Wonderful. Well, you deserve a round of applause for the most determined speaker today. Well done. So, Catherine, um, many people, most people in the audience will know what Cabbage is and know what it does. But very briefly, for those that don't, can you give us just the the 30-second version about Cabbage? Sure thing. So, Cabbage um, has a technology platform that enables small businesses to get through a small business loan application in about seven minutes on average. We provide direct loans to small businesses in the U.S., and we also license our platform to large banks globally, including um, ING, and we just announced a relationship with Santander. Wonderful. And... Um, what is it that makes Cabbage different or special? What's the special source? I think what's very different about us is that we really are a technology company at our core. We didn't start Cabbage because we said, oh, there's a big need in the market for small businesses to get access to capital. We said, oh, there's this really cool new way to get access to data about small businesses. Wouldn't it be neat if you could use that to create a really wonderful user experience and do all the work that the borrower typically has had to do in the past and to do it for them? That's wonderful. And um, of all of the advantages that you think your model has over the incumbents, um, which is the kind of sustainable long-term advantage? I think the the manner in which we access data and the type of data to which we're connected probably gives us the longest term advantage because we've been doing this for, it's a long time in our industry, for five years. Um, But we are connected to hundreds of data sources and we stay connected to them. So it allows us to understand how people behave, not just in the US, but also globally. And we get a holistic view of behavior. And it doesn't have to just be about lending. It happens that's what we're using the data for today. Great. We'll come back to the data point in a bit, but let's, let's open this up to the broader fintech discussion. So this session is called Fintech, a revolution, what's next? Um, is there really a revolution having in, happening in financial services, or is it something different? I think the fintech revolution has always been happening in many ways. I think banks have traditionally embraced technology in ways that we don't imagine. Um, Atlanta is a a hub for fintech because in the 50s, the Fed tested automated payments in Atlanta. And as a result, all of these payment processing companies grew up in Atlanta. And that was a pretty exciting technology at the time. Credit cards were an exciting technology. I think there's always been an emphasis on technology. The fintech revolution today is all about being able to serve customers customers quickly and to serve customers who perhaps didn't have access before and to connect customers, borrowers potentially in many cases, with providers who also are interested in funding loans or funding transactions, things like that. So um, so you would argue there is sort of a revolution happening, but isn't it more about um, an evolution where there's a, a greater sense of partnership between the big banks and insurers and the new kids on the block? And that is true, although, like I said, I've been in this industry for a long time. So banks, financial institutions, insurance companies, you name it, they've always licensed technology from third parties. In fact, if you look at most banks in the U.S., most of the systems they use they get from third parties, everything from fraud management to decisioning to credit processing to transaction processing to core banking systems, all those things are systems that most of them actually license today. And at the time that they started using them, that was a big deal. So lots of people, um, I've asked them what's next for fintech, and there's a kind of growing concern out there that actually what's next might be echoes of 2001 and the dot-com boom. And even today we've seen Alibaba um, announce a $4.5 billion raising, $60 billion valuation. I mean, come on, this is the start of a a bubble ready to burst, isn't it? It's a, it's a little bit hard to say about Ant, just because China is such an astoundingly large market compared to the U.S., and fewer of those 1.4 billion people have access to traditional financial services as opposed to the U.S. and other established markets like Europe. So I think, I mean, maybe it's a little inflated. I think you see more of it, actually, in the U.S. and in Europe with a number of new companies that are getting funded. I just saw a newsletter today that mentioned that there was something like $900 million in venture capital provided just over the last month um, to fintech companies in in the U.S. and abroad. And these are Series A, you know, seed round financing. So you're seeing lots and lots of new entrants in the market. 
So what would be your advice for investors that were looking to deploy money into fintech? Um, you know, it's no different than the, probably what they already do, which is be careful for the follow on. You know, if a company is doing something that's only slightly new or slightly different than what established companies are doing, I think that's hard. I mean, we've seen very, very niche products in the market. In fact, I saw a company that was building a peer to peer marketplace just for financing weddings. To me, that is an example of something that is very hard to grow and scale unless the exit strategy is, well, we're going to sell this to London Club or Prosper or somebody like that. And that's not an investment thesis that most investors follow. They normally are looking to, for something that's going to be a home run. So if you're starting a business, make sure that, and you're looking for funding, make sure that you have something that can truly be a home run, not just a single, not to use a baseball metaphor. So, so which areas of fintech would you point at as being particularly hot right now? Well, I think, I think this peer-to-peer -peer business, which is also marketplace, which is who knows what it really means, but basically online non-bank lending, I think that's cooling down a little bit. I think things like distributed ledger, those are still pretty hot. Um, you're not reading as much about new entrants in the market, but I think the banks are really excited, or some of them are, not all of them, the smaller ones are, about the opportunity for um, access to money movement in a way that's different than what we have today, typically in the US anyway. Yeah, and um, so by distributed ledger, you mean blockchain and those kind of technologies? Yes, exactly, yeah. like Ripple and blockchain. Um, not so much the currencies themselves, um, and forgive me if there are any Bitcoin people in the room, but more so just the method for connecting and, and most importantly for validating identity and for managing those identities and managing those transactions in a safe and secure manner. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount of money going into blockchain at the moment. Um, and my fear is it's at least five years away before we get any real commercial applications that, are, that actually live up to the regulatory standards that you need in this kind of market. Well, I think the, the hard part of it is that the banks really need to adopt it. The large banks need to adopt it. And the money center banks, and again, speaking for the US, um, they don't have a, a tremendous um, impetus to do something like that because they make a lot of money right now on the way they, the slow way they move money. So it's going to have to be something that's sort of regulated. From a, from a safety and security perspective, I think it's probably drastically more secure than what we use today, whether you're talking about ACH or wiring or any of the other sort of faster methods that are in use today. OK, so let's move on and talk about something different. Let's talk about um, the lending market more generally and the role of fintech in the lending market. Um, is the age of the bank branch dead? Is that over with? And, and what do all these fintechs mean for banks? I'm going to ask the audience a question. How many of you have been to a bank branch in the last week? Not a lot. How many of you have been to a bank branch in the last month? Not a lot. How many of you have deposited a check using your mobile device? I think this answers the question. There you go. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what should all the banks do? They've got these huge legacy estates, thousands of branches all over the country, are costing huge amounts of money. What do they do? I think they invest in technology that replicates the branch. Most, I mean, I come, I'm in an industry in a specific vertical that has traditionally always required a visit to a bank branch and further has required a banker visit to your store, to your location, to verify that you're really a business. And so, you know, that's clearly gone away because there are so many now automated small business lenders who are, you know, who are not requiring that visit to the branch and the visit to the, to the business location. So I think investing in technologies that replicate that experience whether it's using, I think mobile is going to be tremendous. So using information on the device, whether it's geolocation or whether it's communication preferences or access to other data that resides in the mobile device to verify identity, to verify location, and to gather information about that business. But it's not just about technology, is it? Because um, technology is a tool, but it has to be backed up by superior customer service, particularly for when things go wrong. Um, how do you at Cabbage think about customer service more broadly? That is a very important um, aspect of what we do. So 95% of our customers have a fully automated experience, meaning they never talk to a customer throughout the application process. And we provide credit lines of up to $150,000 via an automated platform, and most people never talk to anyone. But when they do want to talk to someone, we have someone there. Our net promoter score, which is a measure of customer satisfaction, is actually, um, our last measure was almost 70, 69, I believe. And so um, that is a tremendously high score. It's on par with Apple products 
products with Amazon. And one of the reasons people are excited about it is because they don't have to talk to someone. But if they need to, they can. So I think it's really important. I think that the idea of customer service is you want to be available for the customer when the customer wants to talk to you. You don't want to force the customer to talk to you when they have something else they'd rather be doing. So um, fully automated service for most people. Some people would say, um, you know, I talked about the, uh, the, the, bust, the boom and bust of 2001. In banking, everyone's in fear of the boom and bust of 2008. Um, so how do you make sure that you are doing your job properly and responsibly in terms of credit, given that you're not even speaking to people? So this um, conversation happens a lot, and it frustrates me, because most of these online lenders are actually regulated. We at Cabbage have been through two FDIC audits. So we all have bank partners with whom we work who actually issue the loans. And so that means that by their very nature, these products are regulated and these businesses are regulated. There are a few examples of those that are not, but by and large, whether it's Lending Club or Prosper or On Deck or Funding Circle, everyone has either their own state licenses or they're partnered with institutions and they are regulated. There's lots of talk of this regulatory arbitrage, meaning the, these, these fintech companies are picking apart different pieces of what the banks do, whether it's about lending or whether it's about money movement or whether it's about um, investment advising. And and I think it makes the banks a little bit anxious because they feel like those are some of the things where they've made a lot of money over the past. So they're pushing pretty hard to, to demonstrate that these entities are not regulated, but they really are. Great. Let's move on to another area. Let's talk about um, entrepreneurship. And let's talk about growing a business. Now, I mean, you're a, you're a founder of Cabbage. You've been there from the start. You founded other businesses through the years. What's the most difficult part about being an entrepreneur? I think it's really convincing other people that what you have is a good idea and that you're the right person to take it to the next stage. Um, and, and pulling together all of the various parts that you need to make it happen. And mo all the companies that I've been involved with have been technology companies. And so, you, you know, and I'm not a technologist. I was an English major. So um, I've always needed to trust and rely on the people that I've hired to make those decisions about technology. I know what I wanted to do, but I don't know how to do it. So that's a big challenge if you don't have a technology background. And how do you deal with the constant rejection? Did you have a lot of rejection through the early stages? Oh, we've had a lot of rejection. Um, probably, you know, you have a 0.5% success rate, if not less than that. So um, people, most of the people are going to tell you no. The most important thing about that is to take something from the conversation. So if somebody has an objection, make sure you understand what is that objection, how important is it, is it the stumbling block that's going to prevent them from investing, and address it. If you hear it all the time, then it's probably a really big problem. If you don't hear it very often, then maybe it's not a big problem. But it's important not to assume that every question you don't like is stupid. And, and so once you've got beyond those very early years, the early funding, the early support, how do you then start to build a business? What are the most important things next? I mean, so much of it. It's, it's funny because people ask all the time what it's like to start the company. And we always say it's not like you just woke up in the morning and you're like, OK, here we go. We're starting a company. It's January 1st, and this is what we're doing. You just sort of are doing it. And then before you know it, you're doing it all the time. Um, I think it is really important, of course, to be committed to it all, full time. Whenever I talk to entrepreneurs who say, oh, well, I have this job, and I'm going to do this in the evening, and I'm going to try to get this off the ground, nobody wants to invest in that. But Taking it to the next stage is really about people. It's about surrounding yourself with people who you trust and you can work with um, and who are really, really, really capable of hiring the other people that you need in order to grow the business. And what role does culture play in all of that? Well, for us, culture is very important. You'll see a lot of blog posts about it. And um, we have a, we didn't realize this. I thought I made it up. I was really bummed out that I didn't. Our, our um, head of people operations, which is what most people would call HR, it turns out I didn't make that up. But, um, but I think it's important that we, we stay connected to everybody. We have a weekly town hall where we talk about, um, you know, various things that are happening at the company, including financials. I think people really need information um, about the business to feel motivated and inspired to work their asses off, which is what you want them to do at an early stage. So one of the clients I work with um, in the UK, I'm not going to name them, but they have um, a sauna in their office and they have no management team at all um, or no management meetings at all. Every meeting is open to everyone. How far do you go in that kind of um, uh, more uh, unique culture spectrum? 
Well, we have about 335 employees right now, and I think we're past the point, and perhaps that company is much larger, but I think we're past the point where that makes sense. I think people need to have some sense of direction and some sense of ownership of what they're working on. So for us, it's all about transparency and communication and um, trust. With, trust with their colleagues. Our number one, we have these five core values, the number one is care deeply, to care deeply about each other, to care deeply about our customers, about our investors and our community. And if you go around the company, and we have, we just recently lost our very first person in customer service who left the company, and before she left, she got a cabbage tattoo on her arm. So it was, and so in customer service, you know, it's a very high turnover, so culture is super important to us. We, we, and if you ask people in the company what they love the most about the company, they'll tell you it's the people. And one of the ways we make that happen is Rob and I, my co-founder, we interview every single candidate, um, or at least one of us is there. Like, there's some interviews today I can't be there for. But um, that's something that allows us to stay connected to the people and to make sure that people are a good fit for the company. And what would your team say about your leadership style? Um, they would probably vary from, you know, super hands-off depending on you know how much they can handle on their own to sometimes she's a bit of a bitchy micromanager depending on <laughs> how much support they need <laughs> but i think in general they would say that i'm very open um and um I, I wait to make decisions usually to get the whole picture so um cabbage is valued at a billion um a billion us or more who knows um i mean what on earth keeps you going? Why, why have you flown all this way here today? Why don't you just go off to a Caribbean island and spend your millions? <laughs> well, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is that we haven't had an event such as that. I'm not sure that I would go off and do that, but I think we really believe in what we're building. We never believed that all we're building is a lending platform. We really believed that we're building this data platform that has a global application and can do a lot of things for a lot of different constituents. Um, for example, Google recently shut down their financial tools comparison tool, financial comparison tool. And they did that because they didn't have access to the financial data to make it useful. But we actually have access to all that data and to all the Google data and the Facebook data. And we are in the process of building something that we think is much, much, much bigger than what you've seen us do today. And that's exciting. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, what, what does the future hold for you personally? Um, gosh, a lot of travel. We believe we need to tell the story as much as we possibly can to as many people who, was, who will listen. Um, I think a lot of hiring, a, a lot of sleepless nights. Um, you know, I think we're, it, it, it's, it's very exciting for us to be part of something, like I said, that we think is going to be as big as this will be. So it's a lot about trying to figure out how to make that happen. And um, is there one question that you really wish I'd asked you that I didn't? Oh, my. Um, people ask a lot, how did you go from being an English major to doing what you're doing today? And I will tell you, the, the, the reason I want to talk about this is because my parents gave me a computer when I was nine. So in the summer of 1979, I started using a Radio Shack TRS-80. Most of you were not born yet. But I, I tell you this because make sure you give your children computers, especially your girls. Make sure that you expose them to technology because they may not start writing code, but it's important that they understand and appreciate the value of technology and what that can do for business. Absolutely. So, Catherine, final question for me, and then we'll finish. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be and uh, why? I think I'd want to be able to speak all the languages if I had to pick one. I think that's called polyglottism. Is that the right word for that? I can't remember. Anyway, I think because I would love to be able to communicate with everyone. I was in Japan recently, and um, it was hard because I couldn't find a lot of people that spoke English, and I was using my Google Translate, and I was like, damn it, I really wish I could speak Japanese. So I think that would definitely be the, the superpower I would want. Wonderful. Um, Catherine Petralia Cabbage, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.